Welcome to your Deep Dive Listener. Today, um, we're diving into the world of behavioral data. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Graphs, charts, data points. Sounds a bit intimidating, right? Yeah. But trust me, we're going to decode all of that and uncover the fascinating stories hidden within those lines and bars. We're taking a deep dive into a chapter from an applied behavior analysis textbook, all about how pros in the field use graphs to understand and make decisions about changing behavior. Exactly. These graphs, while they aren't just there to look pretty, they're powerful tools for making informed decisions about behavior change programs, which have a real impact on people's lives. So it's about taking those raw numbers and turning them into something meaningful, something actionable. Precisely. Think of it this way. You wouldn't try to assemble a complex piece of furniture just by looking at a jumble of parts, right? Right. You'd want instructions, a blueprint. Graphs serve a similar purpose in behavior analysis. They provide that visual blueprint, helping us see patterns and trends that might not be obvious just from a list of numbers. So instead of getting lost in a sea of numbers graphs, help us see the forest for the trees. Exactly. And just like a good blueprint helps you put those furniture pieces together in the right order, graphs guide us in understanding how behaviors change over time, especially in response to different interventions. Now, when we say interventions, we're talking about any strategy or technique used to change a behavior. Right, exactly. It could be anything from a new teaching method to a different way of providing positive reinforcement. Got it. So let's talk about the stars of the show line graphs. It seems like they're the go-to visual in the, the behavior analysis world. What makes them so special? Line graphs are fantastic for showing us how behavior changes over time. Imagine you're tracking how many words a student can read per minute. A line graph would show you very clearly if their reading fluency is improving over the course of, say, a semester. It's like a visual timeline of the behavior, yeah. showing us the ups and downs, the peaks and valleys. That's a great way to put it. And here's where it gets even more interesting. By comparing different lines on the same graph, we can see the impact of different interventions or conditions. So let's say we introduce a new reading program. We could have one line showing the student's reading fluency before the program and another line showing their fluency after. That would give us a really clear picture of whether the program is having a positive effect. Exactly. And by comparing those lines, we can see not only if the intervention is working, but also how quickly and consistently those changes are happening. That's fascinating. It's like having a visual representation of cause and effect. But the chapter also mentions all these different parts of a line graph, like the axes, labels, data points. It can feel a bit overwhelming, like learning a new language. Don't worry, you don't need to be a graphing guru to understand these concepts. The key takeaway is that each part of the graph serves a specific purpose in accurately representing the data. So no funny business with the scales or labels to make an intervention look more effective than it really is. Absolutely not. Ethical behavior analysts are all about presenting the data honestly and transparently. We're not trying to tell a fabricated story. We're using graphs to reveal the true story hidden within the data. That makes sense. So we've covered line graphs. They're like the trusty sidekick of behavior analysis. But what about those times when we need a quick snapshot of the data, mm -hmm. like a cheat sheet? That's where bar graphs come in, right? You got it. Bar graphs are fantastic for summarizing data and making quick comparisons. So if we wanted to compare the average reading scores of students across different classrooms using different reading programs, a bar graph would be a great way to visualize that data, right? Precisely. Each bar could represent a different classroom, and the height of the bar would show the average reading score. A quick glance would tell you which classroom had the highest average score. Now that you mention it, that does sound like a much faster way to get the big picture than trying to compare lists of numbers. Exactly. And that ease of comparison makes bar graphs a really valuable tool for communicating findings to a wider audience, like parents or administrators. So line graphs for tracking changes over time, bar graphs for quick comparisons. It's all about choosing the right tool for the job. Exactly. And speaking of the right tool, there's another type of graph that's particularly useful for certain types of behavior cumulative records. These graphs show us the total number of responses over time, with the line on the graph going up every time the behavior occurs. Okay, so if we were tracking how many sight words a student learns over a week, a cumulative record would clearly show their progress, right? With the line steadily climbing upward as they learn more words. You've got it. And that upward slope can be really motivating, especially when we're trying to increase a behavior. But I imagine there are times when a cumulative record wouldn't be the best choice, right? 
Like maybe if the behavior we're tracking can only happen once during an observation period. That's a great point. For example, if we're looking at whether a student correctly completes a math problem on the first try, a cumulative record wouldn't be as useful. We wouldn't expect to see that upward trend because they only get one shot at it. In those cases, a line graph would be a better choice. This is fascinating. It's like choosing the right paintbrush for a masterpiece. The type of graph we choose can really impact how we understand and interpret the data. Absolutely. And speaking of masterpieces, there are even more specialized graphs we can use to reveal even deeper insights. For example, have you ever heard of ratio charts? They sound familiar, but I can't say I'm an expert. Refresh my memory. Ratio charts, dorit. They sound kind of like something you'd find in a science lab. What's the story with those? They might sound complex, but they're really helpful for understanding proportional changes in behavior. Think of it this way. Doubling a behavior from 2 to 4 looks the same as going from 50 to 100 on a ratio chart. It's about the relative change, not just the difference between the numbers. So it's like seeing if a behavior is changing at a similar rate, even if the starting point is totally different. Exactly. It helps us see those proportional relationships, which can be really insightful. Now, if you're ready for something completely different, let's talk about scatter plots. Okay. I'm intrigued. Scatter plots always remind me of those connect the dots puzzles, but instead of a cute picture, we're revealing hidden patterns in behavior. I like that analogy. And just like those puzzles, scatter plots help us see connections we might have missed otherwise. They're great for exploring relationships between two different variables. For example, let's say we want to see if there's a connection between the amount of time a student spends reading each night and their performance on spelling tests. So each dot on the scatter plot would represent a different student showing their reading time and their spelling test score. Precisely. And if we see that the dots generally slope upwards, meaning more reading time tends to go hand in hand with higher spelling scores, that suggests a correlation. Wow, it's like scatter plots give us a visual clue about whether two things might be related. So we've got line graphs for tracking changes over time, bar graphs for quick comparisons, cumulative records for emphasizing progress, and scatter plots for exploring relationships. Talk about having a whole toolkit of visual insights. And remember, choosing the right graph is just the first step. We also need to know how to interpret those graphs accurately right. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Looking at a graph and actually understanding what it's telling us are two different things. Um, are there any common pitfalls people should be aware of when it comes to interpreting graphs? Like, are there ways we can accidentally misread the data? Mm. That's a great question. One common mistake is focusing solely on the endpoint of a graph and ignoring the overall trend. Just because a behavior is at a certain level at the end of the graph doesn't mean that's the whole story. We need to look at the journey, the ups and downs along the way. So it's like reading a book and just skipping to the last page cry. You might miss some crucial plot twists. Exactly. Another common misinterpretation is assuming that correlation equals causation. Just because two things seem to be related based on a scatter plot, that doesn't necessarily mean one is causing the other. There could be other factors at play. That's a really important point. It reminds me of that saying, correlation does not equal causation. Precisely. And that's why it's so important to be critical consumers of data, to question our assumptions, and to look for alternative explanations. This whole conversation has really highlighted the importance of good data. It's like the foundation of a house case. If the data isn't solid, the conclusions we draw from it might be shaky. That's a great analogy. Even the most sophisticated graph is only as good as the data behind it. We need to make sure our measurements are accurate, our observations are careful, and our practices are ethical. It's like we're detectives gathering evidence. We want to make sure the evidence is reliable and trustworthy. But sometimes even with the best data, things can get lost in translation especially if the person looking at the graph isn't familiar with the jargon or the nuances of behavior analysis. How can we make these graphs more accessible to wider audience like parents or educators who might not be data experts? That's a crucial consideration. We need to make sure our graphs are not only accurate but also easy to understand. We can do that by using clear and concise labels, avoiding technical jargon, and providing context. Remember, a graph should tell a story, and we want to make sure everyone can follow along. So it's like writing a good book we want our graphs to be engaging, informative, and accessible to our target audience. Exactly. We want people to feel empowered by the data, not overwhelmed by it. Speaking of empowering, this chapter mentions a specific type of ratio chart that seems to be a rock star in the applied behavior analysis world. The standard acceleration chart, it sounds pretty intense, this is so <laughs> special about it. The standard acceleration chart 
It sounds like something you'd use to track the speed of light or something. It's definitely designed for speed, but in this case, it's the speed of learning. The standard acceleration chart developed by Ogden Lindsley is all about measuring how quickly a behavior changes over time. We call that acceleration. So it's not just about whether a behavior is increasing or decreasing, ah, but how quickly that change is happening. Like if we're trying to increase the number of words a student could read per minute, this chart would show us if they're making slow and steady progress or if they're really picking up speed. Precisely. And here's the really cool part. It uses a special type of scale called a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. Okay, logarithmic scale. What oh, That sounds a bit intimidating. Can you break that down for me? Imagine a chart where the distance between 1 and 10 is the same as the distance between 10 and 100 and the same between 100 and 1,000. That's essentially what a logarithmic scale does. It allows us to see small changes at lower frequencies as easily as large changes at higher frequencies. It's all about emphasizing the rate of change, not just the absolute difference. So it's like a zoom lens for behavior change. Mm -hmm helping us see those subtle shifts that might otherwise get lost in the data. Exactly. And this type of chart is often used in a teaching method called precision teaching. Yeah, precision teaching. Yee, that sounds intriguing. Is it as precise as it sounds? It aims to be. Precision teaching is all about using frequent measurement and visual analysis of data, often with the standard acceleration chart, to make really informed decisions about teaching. It emphasizes fluency and accuracy in learning. So instead of just focusing on whether a student gets a question right or wrong, mm -hmm. precision teaching looks at how quickly and accurately they can perform a skill. You got it. We're talking about building fluency and making those skills automatic. And by charting that data on a standard acceleration chart, teachers can quickly see if a student is making progress at the rate they need to, and if not, they can adjust their teaching strategies accordingly. It's like having a real-time feedback loop built right into the teaching process constantly monitoring progress and making adjustments as needed. That sounds incredibly valuable both for the teacher and the student. Absolutely. It's about using data to personalize instruction and ensure that every student is getting the support they need to succeed. This has been an incredible deep dive. You've gone from the basics of line graph to the complexities of the standard acceleration chart and precision teaching. It's amazing how much information can be packed into a single graph and how that information can be used to make such impactful decisions. And remember, it's not just about the graphs themselves. It's about the critical thinking and problem solving that go into selecting, interpreting, and applying the insights we gain from those graphs. So it's like we've been given this powerful set of tools. Mm. But the real magic happens when we use those tools to understand behavior, guide interventions, and ultimately improve lives. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's about using data to make a real difference in the world. One graph, one data point, one behavior at a time. So listener, the next time you encounter a graph about behavior change, don't shy away. Remember the key takeaways from this deep dive and take a closer look. You might be surprised at the fascinating insights you uncover. Until next time, keep diving deep.